Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Program, which uh, organized tonight's event. Uh, we have here tonight, uh, my great pleasure to introduce, Kenneth Walsh, the White House correspondent and historian, uh, author of many books, and he's here to speak about his latest book, Presidential Leadership in Crisis, Managing Calamity. Um, I would like to, you know, first of all, welcome our uh, audience. I can't say live audience this time uh, because we have none. We're in San Francisco in the middle of uh, the uh, coronavirus crisis. And uh, so we are not meeting in large groups anymore in San Francisco. So we are going to do this all uh, online and virtually. And we're going to test our Commonwealth Club tech uh, knowledge to do this. So welcome all those of you who are uh, watching this directly. And for those of you who watch it later, uh, online or as a podcast in audio, we welcome all of you to listen to a really interesting set of insights into how our presidents led us in crisis. Not that we have a crisis now to talk about. <laughs> thank you very much for coming thank and you. for cooperating with our, our unusual thank approach you. here. Well, thank you, George. And I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for having me and for uh, uh, making uh, a good use of our time in this difficult situation with the, the, uh, the virus that everyone's talking about but I'm confident everything will work out great. And um, when I, um, I also want to mention uh, that I'm happy that my daughter is in the room with me now, who lives in Oakland. And uh, so we have some fa a family uh, event here going on as well. Uh, I uh, have covered the White House for 30, more than 30 years now. And I uh, started covering the White House under President Reagan in his second term. And um, I have done it ever since. So this is the sixth president I've covered now. And I'm always looking for new ways to see the presidents, new ways to understand them, to get insights into them as people, into their agenda, into their policies. And in the books I've written, and this was my ninth book, I've tried to do that uh, looking through the presidents through presidents as celebrities, presidents on Air Force One and what they're like in that very special habitat, uh, presidents in their homes and retreats. And what I've done in this case is look at the presidents under crisis conditions. And really, the dealing with crisis has become a uh, really job definition uh, for the presidents in many ways. Every modern president has had to deal with at least one major crisis, uh, a defining moment. And that's what I've tried to focus on in the book, and that's what we'll be talking about this evening. Uh, so many of the presidents um, have been have these uh, urgent situations thrust upon them, and many times uh, they have very high stakes, uh, not only for the United States, but for the world. I've tried to broaden my discussion in the book of not only foreign policy and national security crises, which uh, tends to be what historians look at, but also personal crises, economic crises, and uh, political crises. So that's what we'll be uh, discussing. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, when you can't when you uh, do a um, an examination of presidents in crisis, you really have to start off with Abraham Lincoln. He was the uh, president who uh, lived up to the standards that I've defined that make the most difference in looking at presidents and how they handle crises, taking action, adapting to changing circumstances, uh, balancing principle with what works, persevering, and having an instinct for achieving success. Lincoln had all of those, and in every survey you find of our greatest presidents, partly because of his crisis management skills, Lincoln often turns out to be number one. Most of the time, he's the number one president listed in that way. Now, why was that? Well, uh, what Lincoln had was a, a certain empathy for people. He also had a sense of embodying the values he was trying to represent and promote during the ultimate crisis we've ever had in the United States, and that was the Civil War. And uh, here we see President Lincoln with General McClellan, who was his uh, Civil War general, who he hired and fired and hired and fired because he wasn't getting from McClellan the kind of aggressive action he wanted. Uh, and, uh, but it just showed that notion of adapting to changing circumstances, uh, persevering that was so important in dealing with this particular crisis and really all of our crises that we have. Um, uh, in discussing Lincoln also, as I said, he came to embody uh, a lot of the values that we have as a country and that we revere today, including the uh, idea that he was suffering from the Civil War along with everyone else. And he let the country see that. Uh, this is Lincoln just before he took office, just before he grew his beard. You can see he looks hale and hearty. He looks like he is uh, sort of uh, has the stature and strength for the job. 
just before he died, just look at what happened to Lincoln. I mean, it's really startling uh, the, the toll the Civil War and the Times took on him. He looks very spectral. And of course, he was assassinated shortly after this. But this was part of his, his really uh, ability as a crisis manager in getting us through the Civil War and ending slavery, uh, coming to symbolize the pain and suffering the country was going through, which people identified with. And uh, he became known, particularly in the African-American community, after he dealt, did so much to end slavery, as Father Abraham. But you saw that uh, participation in the crisis of, of the time in Lincoln's life. Now we fast forward to the modern era. Uh, I define President Roosevelt as the first modern president when the United States became a superpower, when our media became uh, national and mass media and so on. Of course, the first thing he had to deal with in 1933 when he took office was the Depression. Uh, here we see a, a soup kitchen. A lot of people of a certain age will remember this uh, as a very, very horrible time for people, a true calamity for the United States. Unemployment, where you know today we have unemployment rate of less than four percent, and we were very troubled when it reaches eight or nine percent. Uh, during that era, the unemployment rate was in the 30s, 35 percent, and even more in some places. And uh, so people were really desperate. Um, this is another illustration of the times. People would line up to get coffee and donuts because they had nothing else to eat. They they were just at the end of their their uh, livelihoods, and they really needed somebody to help them. And this is where Roosevelt came in, dealing with the crisis of the depression and his big contribution to this and to presidential leadership ever since was the notion of optimism. Franklin Roosevelt came to embody the idea of a president leading us to think that things will get better and that he would lead us that way. We would have setbacks, we would have problems, but the president, President Roosevelt in this case, May convince the country that he would make things better if he was given the chance. And he held fireside chats. That's another important part of his persevering as president, of him representing the country, communicating directly with people on the radio, which was the dominant mass medium of his time and which he mastered. And that's another important thing in presidents and as crisis managers, mastering the media of the time. And this is what Roosevelt did on radio. Uh, it was said that... Um, he achieved what we call today market penetration, where uh, he was able to announce when he was going to give a fireside chat. Uh, virtually every family could have access to a radio, either their own or borrowing or sitting around with others and listen. And there was anecdotal stories at the time that people could walk down the street in a town and a hamlet in a big city. And if people had their windows open, you could hear everything Roosevelt said without missing a word because people were so interested in hearing the president. And he was able to convey the sense of optimism and the idea that he would get us through. That was a tremendous contribution he made to the notion of presidential crisis management and to the idea of presidential leadership. Harry Truman, of course, took over from the presidency, the presidency after Franklin Roosevelt died in April of 1945. Uh, we had the Korean War then. Uh, the uh, Korean War started a few years after that, a terrible experience for the United States. You can get a little sense of the tra trauma and the difficulty that our soldiers had to deal with in the Korean War. Uh, we had a lot of setbacks in the Korean War. We had uh, then finally some uh, successes uh, led by General MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur had been a hero in World War II in the Pacific. A lot of Americans really respected him. And he took over our forces in Korea and was actually doing pretty well. Then, of course, he overreached. And those of us familiar with the Korean War history understand how he did overreach. He felt that uh, after the Chinese entered the war, what he allowed American and South Korean troops to get too close to the Chinese border in trying to push the North Koreans back out of South Korea, the Chinese entered the war and it completely changed and it became a very difficult job to push the Chinese back. Uh, MacArthur served notice that he wanted to use nuclear weapons. He served notice that it was time while we had the military ready to take on the communists and was really beating the war drums. Harry Truman, who was president at the time, uh, resisted MacArthur. He felt MacArthur was going too far. He met with MacArthur in Wake Island in the Pacific to try to get a sense of what he was dealing with here with MacArthur as a person. He assessed MacArthur. He felt MacArthur was sort of a preening uh, general who could not be controlled. And in the end, uh, when MacArthur did not back off 
his pushing for a very bellicose policy toward the communists and toward the Korean War, Truman fired him. And that's the case study that I use in the book to talk about political courage. Um, MacArthur was far more popular than Truman was. Truman was having a lot of trouble in his presidency. The economy was going bad. We were having lots of difficulties with unions and with strikes and with dealing with communists abroad and with our budget and so on. Uh, so he took on a very powerful and popular figure, but he did it because he felt like he could not give up his prerogative as commander in chief. And it was civilian control of the military. It took a lot of political courage for Truman to do this, but he did show that uh, he had that. And that's a very important part of crisis management that Truman did show. So that's one example of the political courage that is very important in assessing presidents as crisis managers. Uh, now we move on to President Eisenhower. <clears throat> President Eisenhower is generally considered by historians as a, a popular and successful president, but he did have a major setback in dealing with the Soviet Union at the time. This is Eisenhower with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time during happier times. Mm -hmm. uh, Eisenhower was uh, intent on getting as much intelligence as he could about the Soviet Union and their nuclear capabilities, so he authorized the U-2 spy flights. These were high technology flights that flew over Soviet territory and took uh, very uh, impressive close-up photos of the um, Soviet uh, landscape and their military installations. Uh, the Soviets tried to shoot these U-2 American spy planes down a number of times, but they failed. Then they finally did shoot one down. And Eisenhower authorized lies to be told about what it was. He said, um, these planes could not survive a major attack. The pilots uh, probably died uh, if they were hit. And um, they also, also had these poison uh, uh, pills or pins they could inject themselves with uh, to kill themselves so they wouldn't be captured. So Eisenhower authorized the lies to be told, saying it was a weather flight. And the Soviets actually shot the plane down and captured the American pilot, Francis Gary Powers. And Khrushchev made a big uh, production of showing the wreckage, which you see here. And so Eisenhower was caught in the lie. And lots of presidents feel that uh, they want to protect themselves during a crisis like this. But I think over time, we've come to learn that in something as high stakes in, as this, it's very difficult for presidents to get away with deception. And that, that unfortunately, is what Eisenhower learned. Uh, this set back the United States in dealing with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And Eisenhower later said this was the biggest mistake he made as president, as handling the crisis of the U-2 flights. So that's an example of a president not doing well in a crisis, even someone as popular and politically savvy as Eisenhower was during his presidency. Kennedy, President Kennedy succeeds Eisenhower. He's also dealing with Nikita Khrushchev. He comes into office thinking he was going to deal with the Soviet Union as his main priority, which he started out doing. He's meeting here with Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna, during a summit meeting they had in his first year in office, 1961. Uh, Khrushchev sizes Kennedy up and feels that he's shallow, he's not a strong person, and he can be taken advantage of. And you saw that uh, not only uh, in the um, in Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, which was a disaster for the United States, a failed invasion of Cuban exiles supported by the United States, but you also saw that the following year in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, this is a case where the Russian, the Soviets were building up offensive missile capabilities in Cuba, 90 miles off the Florida coast, and it pitted sort of three people uh, in, in the uh, antagonism here, Fidel Castro, the leader of Cuba, Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and President Kennedy, the leader of the United States. Initially, things did not go well. Uh, the Americans were taken by surprise. They weren't sure what the so Soviets were doing, how, uh, far they would go. And Kennedy had learned from his experience in the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion that failed uh, that he should trust his instincts, but also he should listen to the people who had proven right in the past. So what you're getting here is a president adapting to church, changing circumstances, listening and learning, which he did. And this is him giving the famous speech, announcing a quarantine we're familiar with that term today with the <laughs> coronavirus, but uh, he announced a quarantine preventing Soviet ships from reaching 
Cuba, a very dangerous, risky thing to do. And America was riveted by it. This is a photograph of people watching the president in the showroom at a department store where they sold televisions, where you could see the, the people just followed every move of this. And those people who were aware of this and people of a certain age, again, who lived through this will always remember how close we came to the nuclear precipice. And, uh, but what Kennedy did is uh, not only uh, take the big gamble of putting it all out there, what was actually happening, but having the confrontation with the Soviet Union very publicly, a very risky thing to do. The pride of the United States and the president was on the line. The pride of the Soviet Union and Nikita Khrushchev were on the line. This is, it absolutely was a central issue facing the country and the world at the time. And um, largely because Kennedy listened and learned, uh, because he followed the advice of his uh, uh, most trusted advisors, including his brother Robert, who was the guy who did who was delegated to meet with the Soviets privately to get this thing resolved, uh, and also Kennedy's being unflappable and being uh, able to uh, handle this without uh, going to extremes, which is also very important in these defining moments. Uh, Kennedy was able to extract the United States from this by getting the Soviets to move their missiles out of Cuba in exchange for agreeing not to invade Cuba and pulling American missiles out of Turkey. Those two were not disclosed at the time because that would have, uh, I think, made the president look weak in trading one thing for another, but that's really what he did. So he handled that. I think he's generally seen as a brilliant example of crisis management. Um, now we move on to Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was president during the Vietnam War uh, in 1968. Uh, there was the terrible setbacks in the war, the Tet Offensive, which was uh, an invasion by communist forces that took the Americans and the South Vietnamese by surprise throughout the, the Vietnam. Americans and the South Vietnamese actually won most of these battles, but it showed the country the United States, that the communists were in this for the long haul and they were not going to be deterred. So all the talk that Johnson had made about how we we're at the light of the end of the tunnel, we were about to win the war, the bottom fell out of all that and people felt that they were lied to. Uh, and then one thing after another was happening and going wrong. Johnson was accused of being a war criminal. We had massive protests. He couldn't speak around the country unless uh, he spoke to a, on a military base or a conservative college campus because of these very, very virulent protests against him. And so what he ended up doing is he uh, announced in a very dramatic move, and I was a young fellow at the time, and I remember this uh, very vividly. My college roommates and I were, were just called immediately after Johnson went on TV and announced he was not going to run again for election. So this took a uh, uh, political courage on his part. Now you could argue he didn't, he wasn't going to win, but he was still a very powerful person and he had always treasured the idea of being president. So it did take a measure of, uh, I think, uh, political daring for him to do this and to decide not to run again. So this is an example of a political crisis that a president, I think, handled well by agreeing not to run, avoiding the divisions that they would have caused and um, recognizing the, the reality of the situation, which is very important for presidents to do during crisis conditions, that the country was so divided that he could not deliver effective leadership at the time. And that was uh, the Lyndon Johnson defining moment in many ways. Uh, Richard Nixon, of course, we all know about the Watergate scandal. Richard Nixon loved the idea of being the tough guy, which you can see in this photograph. He loved the idea that he would not be deterred in getting his agenda through. He would not back off in a fight and so on. And uh, that's what he did. But Watergate, uh, a failure of presidential leadership, a failure of crisis management, stonewalling the Congress, failing to disclose what had happened. If he had disclosed immediately the burglary that was at the heart of Watergate and the, um, the uh, part that his advisors and his staff played in that, without him at the time, although there's some evidence that he might have known about it, but if he had owned up to it at the beginning, I don't think he would have had nearly the political problems he ended up having. But one thing led to another, one uh, lie, one deception after another, fueled by the distrust Americans had of him because of the Vietnam War and the feeling he was not explaining uh, properly how badly Vietnam was going and what we were doing that was not working. He resigned just as he was about to be impeached by the House of Representatives. Was not impeached, but he resigned rather than face that. 
And this is the famous photo of him at the, uh, at the helicopter door when he left uh, the um, uh, White House in August of 1974. Uh, this is an example that I talk about in the book about a president failing in crisis management, failing in this political crisis for a number of reasons, not adapting to changing circumstances, not embodying the best values that we have as a nation, um, failing to uh, understand that people needed a realistic information about things. In many cases, uh, just the opposite really of President Lincoln and what he did so long ago uh, in, the, in his own political and military crisis. Uh, moving ahead now, uh, briefly, President Ford, who succeeded Nixon, was not elected. He was named by Nixon as his vice president after the previous vice president resigned in, in a corruption scandal. Ford had to decide in his own political scandal or his own political crisis what to do about Nixon, and he decided to pardon Richard Nixon. This was considered a tremendous um, um, uh, error on his part at the time. Uh, because the feeling was that um, the, Nixon needed to be, had to pay more of a price than he had paid, but Ford felt that we couldn't get past this Nixon scandal unless he pardoned Nixon and moved on to other things. At the time, uh, he really, Ford really suffered over this, but he did demonstrate a good deal of political courage because uh, even though he probably lost his bid for election in 1976 because he pardoned Nixon, Historians and even members of prominent uh, liberal American families, such as the Kennedy family, Ted Kennedy for one, said that they were wrong about Ford and pardoning Nixon, that he did the right thing and he did show he was a profile in courage in the Kennedy terms in pardoning Nixon. Probably cost him the presidency, but Ford, uh, I think, is pretty much acknowledged as having done the right thing at that point. The Iranian hostage crisis. Another real calamity for the country, a political and military crisis. Jimmy Carter was president. The uh, Iranians uh, were reacting um, after uh, radical uh, uh, Islam and Muslims took over the country. Uh, they decided to take over the United States Embassy in Tehran, which they did. They took about 60 Americans hostage, which you see here. They held them for about a year. Try as he might, Carter was unable to get them released. And uh, he, this is him at a prayer service. He was calling for prayers for the hostages. Embargoes, although he imposed embargoes against Iran much too late. Uh, he was, his is considered a failure of leadership during the Iranian hostage crisis. Uh, the, the low point was when he decided uh, to send a mission to rescue them, to send American forces to get the hostages out of Tehran a mission that was probably doomed to failure from the beginning, a almost impossible mission from the beginning. And of course, uh, our helicopters failed in the desert. Um, American troops were killed during the rescue mission. It was aborted and it was an utter calamity for the Carter presidency. Uh, now uh, we move on to uh, President Reagan. Uh, this is an example of a personal crisis. It's it, as personal as it can be because it almost involved the death of the president. President Reagan, in uh, some weeks after he took office in 1981, was shot outside a hotel in Washington after he had given a speech. Uh, Reagan, this is the moment when he was shot. Uh, a bullet was shot from the side. You can see the Secret Service agents looking off to the side to see the shooter, John Hinckley Jr., firing uh, rounds at the president. Uh, hit a Secret Service man, a policeman, a, the, uh, the uh, White House press secretary. Uh, a bullet uh, bounced off the side of the armor-plated limousine, and a fragment from that bullet is what you see Reagan reacting to here. It pierced his chest. He was, um, wasn't was sure what it, exactly if he had been hit. The secret, One of the Secret service agents, service agents named Jerry Parr pushed him into the vehicle so roughly to get him out of there that Reagan thought that Parr, the Secret Service man, had broken one of his ribs. And so he said, you know, he cursed at the guy and he said, You've, uh, you know, you've broken one of my ribs, you know, why don't you watch what you're doing? And it turned out that Reagan had been shot. And so Barr noticed he was bleeding from the mouth. So rather than take him to the White House, took him to the emergency room of a local hospital. And that saved his life because if he had gone to the White House, he certainly would have died from what the surgeons and physicians say now. He went, and this is a case where not only was he personally um, able to show the country that he, uh, was able to deal with this calamity, but he did it with a certain grace and pressure and a sense of humor, which people did appreciate 
uh, went to the hospital and in, he felt he was, he had been an actor. So he felt there was a role he was playing as president. So rather than get out of the limousine and be helped to, into the hospital, he got out, got to his feet rather awkwardly, buttoned up the suit of his jacket and walked in, whereupon he collapsed in the lobby. But he felt that the president always had to show strength and dignity. And that's what a lot of Americans um, respected about him. Uh, and it made a big difference in his presidency. I think there was a tremendous boost of support for Reagan. It helped him with his uh, tax cuts, with his uh, regulation, anti-regulation proposals, with his uh, dealings with the Soviet Union, because people felt like he had survived the assassination attempt with such dignity and uh, grace. And the White House was very clever about this. Uh, they um, released very carefully photos of Reagan to show that he was having a miraculous recovery. This is him at the hospital walking just a couple of days after he was almost killed uh, to show that he was making this amazing recovery. Uh, they arranged to him to have photographs taken looking like he was doing work. He wasn't doing a lot of work, but they made it seem like he was. So this was public relations, really, 101. And uh, they also like to show the support, uh, this big card that the uh, White House uh, staff had uh, taken of a big photograph of the staff on the steps of the executive office building. Uh, it was actually a terrific public relations, terrific communication skills, and showed that Reagan did really have an instinct uh, of being um, rather uh, courageous and having a, a remarkable amount of stamina, particularly for a man of his age in dealing with this personal calamity of almost being killed in an assassination attempt. Um, and this is, again, a case of Reagan, that image building to show this man in his 70s pumping iron uh, not too long after he was shot. Uh, again, he couldn't do this very long, <laughs> uh, but they managed to get pictures of it when he did do it. Um, and again, the image of the Reagan, that Reagan loved, the, uh, the uh, engaged and, um, and uh, aggressive Westerner uh, Hale and Hardy taking on the problems of the country. Uh, President Bush, who succeeds Reagan um, and the Persian Gulf War. Uh, President Bush uh, felt like he had been um, almost, almost raised to uh, be in charge of a war like this. He had been the head of the Central Intelligence. He had been vice president under Reagan. He had been envoy to China. He had been envoy to the United Nations. He always felt he was a foreign policy expert in many ways. And so when Iran, uh, excuse me, when Iraq invaded Kuwait um, uh, early in, in midterm, about midway in his presidency, this became the defining mission of George Bush. He, all his skills that he had developed all his life uh, in foreign policy and so on, understanding the need not only for perseverance and all the standards that I discussed earlier, but the idea that uh, the country wanted the president to stand up for uh, the United States and to stabilize the situation, the oil shocks and so on over there. And he was very effective in demonizing Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq who had invaded Kuwait. This is a trip that uh, Bush made to uh, the war zone before the war started. I was on this trip with him um, and he was actually so moved, which he let people see by the soldiers he was about to launch into harm's way. He of course had been a war hero in World War II and uh, so he knew what it was like. But this was really uh, really a situation that he was really uh, made for. He uh, developed a powerful international coalition, wasn't going it alone with the United States, had a lot of countries uh, uh, working on this whole situation with us, including countries from the Middle East, which took a lot of doing. And he was able to uh, roll Kuwait out, uh, roll uh, the Iraqis out of Kuwait, did not invade Kuwait because he felt that that would involve too much of a uh, long-term commitment and create too much animosity and the American people would not stand for that. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute because his son had exactly the opposite feeling. And uh, it was a war that uh, the Americans won uh, very quickly and uh, with enormous air power with uh, technology. And this is an example of an Iraqi tank. They were supposed to be have this tremendous tank force, but it was no match for the Americans. So it was a big success as the war that uh, Americans, that Bush felt America needed to wage to get rid of the Vietnam syndrome, as he called it, which is a reluctance that Americans had for many, many years not to get involved in a foreign war in a big way. He felt that the war in, the, in uh, Kuwait had 
sort of gotten us past that. Now, uh, again, not a, not a foreign policy issue. This is the famous uh, Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal. This is a political scandal that Clinton did survive. Uh, he had uh, an affair with a White House intern during his second term as president. Um, and initially he lied about it. This is the famous case where he denied this. He's saying here with his wife, Hillary Clinton behind him, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Well, he had, and he lied about it. He later admitted he had lied about it under oath. And this was a tremendous uh, burden he had to bear. And um, he was uh, impeached over it by the House of Representatives and acquitted in the Senate. Uh, now, uh, I don't think Clinton, uh, given what we have now with the Me Too movement and with women being much more uh, believed when they make accusations of sexual harassment and sexual abuse and, and so on, I'm not sure Clinton could have survived this today because uh, uh, times have changed so much. But he was acquitted. Um, he was able to separate his personal conduct from his public policies. He managed to persuade the country that he was a good president, even though he was a scoundrel personally. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a big distinction. So he showed tremendous survival skills politically, even if it took a, a tremendous toll on his reputation historically, which he still has to deal with today. Um, now we're coming up more closer to present time. This is, of course, the famous moment uh, in 9-11 uh, when the terrorists took over airplanes, crashed them into the World Trade Towers in New York, which you see here, and crashed one into the Pentagon. And then a fourth plane, which was hijacked, went down in the Pennsylvania countryside when the passengers tried to take control of the, the plane and it, it crashed. Um, this was President Bush's moment, of course, the son of President George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, his presidency was sort of floundering. He was drifting. Uh, and this gave him a mission for his presidency. This is the moment when he was told that the second plane had hit the second tower. He was at an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida, giving a talk about uh, education policy. His chief of staff he had been told before he went out that the first plane hit the first tower. He didn't, no one knew what it was. He, he thought presently, he told me later, he thought it was a pilot having a heart attack. Then his chief of staff, Andy Card, tells him, a second plane has hit the second tower. America is under attack. Those are the words he used. And you can see Bush looks rather dazed here, and he was. He didn't quite know what was going on or what he should do about it. But as that day progressed, and as the next couple of days progressed, he did find his uh, stability and he did uh, get more, much more steadfast. And he realized that this was a terrorist act and he had to show strong leadership. This is the moment when he had the bullhorn in 9-11 uh, at two days, three days later in New York at Ground Zero. Uh, I was actually here. I'm just off the frame of this photograph. I was at this actual event. We all knew when we saw this that this would be one of the most memorable moments of his presidency. Uh, he stood on top of a burned out fire truck at Ground Zero. That's where the, one of the trade towers was. Uh, and uh, he started to talk. And this fireman, uh, he pulled up from the crowd, turned out to be a volunteer who had retired, who was there to help out. And he pulled him up and he started to talk. And uh, the first responders kept shouting, I can't hear you. We can't hear you. So he grabbed a bullhorn horn and he said, uh, uh, now can you hear me? And they started to chant USA, USA. And he said, well, the people who knock these buildings down will hear from all of us very soon. That's exactly what the country wanted to hear from President Bush. So I think he handled that initial crisis of 9-11 quite well. The problem was the long-term dealing with it, invading uh, the uh, Afghanistan, uh, invading uh, Iraq, which, of course, his father had not occupied Iraq, and the son did. And we're still living with the consequences, very negative, of that invasion of Iraq and turning that whole region into turmoil. So I, this is where my definition here of this defining moment for Bush is. Initially, he did very well. As time went on, he overreached and made some very fundamental mistakes in handling that crisis. Uh, President Obama, uh, we're moving now much closer to the current times. Um, he uh, inherited a terrible economic crisis. You remember the Great Recession. This is uh, Time Magazine did a clever cover picture of him showing him uh, looking like Franklin Roosevelt uh, 
with the jaunty. Uh, this is the way Franklin Roosevelt used to travel in the car with the cigarette holder and the hat. And uh, a lot of comparisons were made to President Obama dealing, as Roosevelt had dealt with the Depression, Obama's dealing with the re Great Recession. The economy was close to collapse. It wasn't a depression, but uh, we, had, we had banks failing. We had major investment houses failing, and unemployment was soaring through the roof. People were wondering if we were going to survive. And Obama uh, it took really dramatic action to deal with this. Now, a lot of people feel, particularly liberal politicians, feel that he didn't go far enough. He could have used the occasion to use the crisis to have some absolutely fundamental reforms taking on Wall Street, taking on the big banks, uh, maybe uh, in, imposing certain um, uh, guarantees of income and so on for people. But he didn't. He, he just wanted to stabilize the initial crisis, which he did, and he did it quite successfully. Uh, the other part of this is he saved the auto industry. Uh, people tend to forget today that the auto industry was on, seemed to be on its last legs. That is a fundamental part of our economy, not only people who work for the auto companies, but distributors and suppliers and people who, who uh, are, are in the supply chain and the employment chain. And he took, took a, a gamble by using federal funds to rescue the auto industry, uh, but he went ahead and did it. And I think it took a certain amount of political courage to do that and to stand up not only to the conservatives, but the people in his own party who felt that the auto companies deserved what they got. They weren't running fuel efficient cars and so on, but he saved the auto industry. And I think that he deserves good credit for that. And, and the economy was um, rebounding quite well as his presidency proceeded. And I think that's uh, largely in due to Obama's willingness to persevere, to uh, understand, to listen, to learn, to, uh, to understand. He was getting advice from some of the best economic minds in the country, and he listened to them. We can't really say that today. Uh, <laughs> we're now up to the present time. Uh, President Trump is a whole different kind of leader. His handling of uh, crises uh, is much different than what we've seen in the modern era. President Trump likes to create crises so he can solve them and come out of them as uh, a winner. Everything with him is, is he personally the winner. Uh, he came to office that he was the outsider, the deal maker. He was going to correct the problems that Washington had. And... Um, so he started off with one thing after another. Uh, he fledged in his campaign to build a wall between the United States and Mexico and get the Mexican uh, government to pay for it. The Mexican government refused to pay for it, but he kept pushing for the wall, pushing for the wall, and it caused a government shutdown, the longest we've ever had, 35 days. So my argument is that this is a self-created crisis that President Trump came up with, and it did hurt a lot of people uh, who, who were dependent on... Uh, uh, the government uh, work and government contracts when the government shut down. President Trump then declared a national emergency that we needed a wall because of the crisis at the border. I think you could argue that that was way overdone, but he did say that. And uh, we're still trying to get the wall built now and sort of reinventing the promise he made, <laughs> saying that uh, he'll get the uh, money done through means such as using military funds to pay for the wall rather than get Mexico to pay for it. Um, then you had the other uh, major crisis that we have to deal with, the impeachment movement against President Trump. This started off uh, as a conflict between President Trump and Robert Mueller, who was the special counsel investigating uh, the alleged collusion between the Russians and the American campaign of Donald Trump in 2016, designed to defeat Hillary Clinton, the Democratic nominee. Um, Trump investigated, uh, was investigated by Mueller for uh, almost two years. Then the um, report came out, and um, through some rather clever initial public relations, a lot of the findings of the report were submerged in the uh, initial coverage, and it was never quite clear that Mueller had not really uh, exonerated Trump fully, but was deferring prosecution or accusations to Congress because he didn't feel he was authorized. He was a special counsel, not an independent counsel. He wasn't authorized to pursue those things. But nevertheless, um, this kept building and building. And um, then the uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House from California, uh, from San Francisco, uh, was reluctant to actually pursue the impeachment proceedings against President Trump. 
But then came the famous phone call between President Trump and the leader of Ukraine, Zelensky, um, in which President Trump said and admits saying that um, uh, if you investigate Joe Biden, who he anticipated being the number one or one of the number one Democratic presidential candidates, he would uh, take action to release money to help the Ukrainians stand up against Russia, which is threatening Ukraine. So this became the centerpiece of the impeachment proceedings. And um, what Trump tried to do is to turn it against Biden by saying that uh, what he was trying to do was to get investigations in the Ukraine of Joe Biden, now emerging as the leading Democratic candidate, as was expected initially, and his son Hunter, well, who was being investigated by the Ukrainians, that Joe Biden was trying to get his son off the hook in the investigation. Uh, it gets complicated, but Biden suggested that he was trying to get the prosecutor to do more investigating, not less. But nevertheless, we're going to see a lot about this in the campaign. Uh, this went on and on. Trump kind of collided with Adam Schiff, uh, the congressman who was in charge of much of the investigation. And he was acquitted in the Senate. Uh, of course, the House was controlled by Democrats, the Senate by Republicans. So it was pretty much expected. But he will always have that stain on his record as having been uh, impeached. The impeachment, of course, is a, char is a charge. Uh, the Senate then decides what to do about it. But he was impeached, and he will always have that stain. So in that sense, I don't think he handled the impeachment crisis well, because he, he would not cooperate. Uh, he would not um, uh, admit any wrongdoing at all. And I think it was pretty clear that there were, was, were wrongs that were committed. And this hardened the opposition to him and caused many more Americans to distrust him. Now we're coming up to the current moment. The uh, coronavirus. This is uh, some treatment that's being given. Uh, and this is, could be the defining moment of the Trump administration in how he's dealing with this. Um, President Trump is using a lot of the techniques he's used throughout his presidency, uh, stonewalling, um, not um, uh, admitting any mistakes, uh, even if uh, it's at the very beginning of the crisis and he could correct the mistakes and then look much better. He just is very slow off the mark in dealing with this. Uh, and I think there's not a lot of uh, a praise I would give him right now. I think that uh, maybe he'll, uh, to give him the benefit of the doubt, maybe he'll correct the mistakes. Uh, lack of testing, I don't, I don't think he has understood how uh, nervous and concerned people would be. People can't get tested for this adequately. Uh, a lot of uh, the public health professionals are saying that the, the administration was slow off the mark. Now, if we're getting the situation where more and more Americans are coming down with this virus and more Americans are going to die of it, he's going to have, Trump will have a huge problem justifying his initial, initial slow response. And I think that's what we're all looking at now as this as a possible defining moment as President Trump handles this crisis. And uh, this is him when he's trying to announce some of the initial uh, measures that a lot of people felt were too little and too late. Um, now, just in conclusion, uh, and then I think George will have some questions that some of our uh, listeners and viewers have brought up. Um, I think what we're left with here is a sense that um, um, in many ways, mo in my review of the modern presidents, uh, we've had almost a providential luck that our presidents have dealt with major crises generally well, I think. Now, I've shown you some examples of where it has not happened, but, um, and we might have a case now where we have a, a basic crisis where things are not going to go well. But I think that uh, uh, our leadership has really stood up pretty w successfully in these defining moments and in these crises over time. And I think that uh, is, uh, is difficult to explain, except that um, we've been fortunate. Uh, we've had the right people at the right time. And the question is now whether that continues with the current administration. Great. Thank you very, very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to remind our audience, uh, both online and, and uh, uh, through the Zoom uh, that we're doing right now, uh, that they're listening to Ken Walsh uh, speaking about his book on presidential leadership and the crises that they've faced. Um, and I'd like to remind all the people that are uh, doing this live with us uh, that there is a little place to uh, hit chat and you can put your questions right into there and, and then we can ask them of Ken directly.
So uh, basically what you're saying is that uh, honesty is almost always the best policy for the presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the questions that came in is, has there been any successful presidential cover-ups? Um, you know, what, what, what kind of crises, uh, where it works for it to be kept under the, under the radar? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there's a number of cases during the Cold War where we had, you know, spying cases, cases of American intervention in other countries um, that was kept under the rug uh, in Latin America, in, uh, in uh, Europe, and so on. I don't think we've really gotten to the bottom of those yet. Now, those weren't like the huge calamities that, for instance, that Eisenhower had to feel in the U2, face in the U2, which did set the, made the Cold War worse. Uh, there was a um, there was a uh, international conference that the Americans and the Soviets and the British and the French and the Germans were supposed to participate in, and that was canceled because of the U2, and very openly because of that. And uh, so it really did set the uh, the, the Cold War back uh, um, in, a, in a number of ways. But um, I, I think that. Uh, you know, many, we always, as covering the White House, um, talk about, um, you know, does the president have a right to lie in any situation? They always say, uh, they used to say they don't, but now you get less certainty of that. <laughs> um, there were uh, cover-ups, for instance, when uh, we invaded the, the nation of Grenada to mm -hmm. save the American students and so on there under President Reagan. They did tell lies about that to indicate that nothing was going to happen because they wanted it to be a surprise. So the question is, was that justified by national security uh, or could they have just denied it and not lied about it and mm -hmm. saying it's not going to happen? So I think that, you know, we've become aware of a number of cases where lies have been told and uh, presidents have gotten away with it. But uh, nothing, I think, in terms of uh, sort of a fundamental issue that, um, uh, that they've had to deny that they turned out to be lying about. So that's the way I look at it. Um. Another question is about the media uh, and the media reaction. You're part, you're part of the White House Correspondents uh, Group and so on and so forth. And um, somebody, the, somebody gave us a great question about in what crisis did the news media do the best and, or do the worst? In other words, uh, you know, how do they contribute to it, to helping it or, or against it or just covering it? Well, right. It's not really clear whether it's about making it worse or better. Right. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the way I look at this is that the media uh, have been tempted historically to go along with American military operations out of patriotism when we, and I, I always thought of myself as part of the media and still do, when we shouldn't be. Um, I remember when uh, we had the, um, the Bay of Pigs invasion that was unsuccessful under President Kennedy. Uh, later, the story went that a uh, uh, columnist from the New York Times uh, said, uh, you know, we were coming upon this story, but we held it back because uh, in deference to the operation. And President Kennedy said, I wish you had run the story uh -huh. because you might have saved us this terrible, devastating defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we didn't, I think in the media, we tend to, to give the president the benefit of the doubt too many cases. That happened again when President Bush, the son uh, invaded uh, Afghanistan and uh, and Iraq, and we gave him the benefit of the doubt. Remember, weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. which the media basically took at face value and which were never found, and that was a fundamental reason for that war. So I think that uh, in many cases, we in the media tend to go along with the mood of the moment. Now, uh, on the other side of this, in Vietnam, the, the opposite happened. Mm -hmm. And part of what's happened since then is the reaction against Vietnam, because a lot of journalists felt that perhaps we were not as uh, supportive of the troops as we should have been. Mm -hmm. We allowed demonization, demonization of American troops in Vietnam. And I can remember seeing that myself in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a reaction against that. But um, so I think it's on these military conflicts, I think by and large in recent years, and decades, I think the media have probably gone too far in accepting what administrations say at face value and we shouldn't. Okay. Just got a new question, a very good one. But all the presidents you talked about today, who is your favorite and why? And we know that it's Lincoln because uh, he, he, <laughs> he covered everything. So let's, let's go to the modern <laughs> ones. Pick up somebody from the modern ones, make it a little bit harder. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, I, I get this question quite a bit actually in many talks that I give. 
I've covered six presidents now, and in my experience, uh, the most the president I liked the best was Bush, the father, because mm-hmm. he was a very decent man. He he didn't take things personally. He was trying to do the right thing, I believe, and he was never um, he never uh, practiced attack politics that we see so much of today. He did some of that, but nothing like the level of demeaning and derision and nastiness we see today. He was, he was very good to people around him also, and that's really, in my mind, a very uh, important way of evaluating presence as people, how they treat their subordinates, how they treat people around them. The most historically important president was, I think, Reagan, because he did change the course of the country, making it uh, more uh, culturally conservative and foreign policy conservative. The president who was the most interesting was Bill Clinton, (laughs) (laughs) for a lot of obvious reasons. (laughs) All right, there's a question about Bill Clinton. So in in, uh, 96, um, Bill Clinton, uh, I mean, uh, China, uh, shot off some (laughs) rockets over Taiwan. And at the same time, they were, they'd already made a deal for uh, Hong Kong to come back. That had been done many years earlier, and they made a deal for Macau to come back. Uh, so the idea was that they were trying to tell Taiwan that they had to come in. And there was a delay in, in uh, the usual U.S. response, which is to send the 7th Fleet through there. Right. There's a whole bunch of scuttlebutt about what caused that delay and why Bill Clinton delayed it for three or four weeks before he sent the 7th Fleet through. Do you know anything about that crisis? You know uh, that I, I heard some scuttlebutt that that um, there were you know these private deals were being made and that uh, the president was trying to sort of cozy up more to the, to the Chinese, but none of that has been proven. So I really don't have much, really much to add to that. Okay, but there, there's something that the way to get the the Chinese to not do it was to give them the 2008 Beijing yes. Olympics. That was that's been said. Yeah, other that, that's been said. I think I mean uh, I I don't think that would would have changed their it. mind. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I remember hearing that rumor, but thinking you need something much more profound to get them to change something as, as, as fundamental to them as, you know, whether Taiwan is part of China. I just don't think that was ever going to work. Yeah. Great. Um, here's a provocative question. Do presidents hope for a crisis of some kind during their term in order to prove their mettle? You know, Bill Clinton talked about that. He said, you know, he said, this is before the impeachment crisis. Mm-hmm. He said, um, I'm, looks like I'm not going to have a big foreign policy crisis where I could show I'm a historically important president and I could handle it so brilliantly. Mm-hmm. Now, um, when uh, President Obama first took office during the financial crisis, Rahm Emanuel, who was his chief of staff, who had been Bill Clinton's political uh, advisor, said, uh, this is a case where we don't want to let a good crisis go to waste. (laughs) Now, a lot of people who were suffering from that crisis didn't like that, the sound of that. So there was a sense among some of Obama's people that this would show Obama as this historically uh, consequential president. Uh, But it became such a real uh, devastating problem for the economy that I think they uh, realized that they were playing with fire here. They needed to get this done as soon as possible. And um, so, as I say, they alienated a lot of liberal liberals in their party uh, and sided in a lot of ways with the big banks. But nevertheless, um, uh, I think that some presidents do want to have a big crisis. I think Teddy Roosevelt was another one. He never had a big war and he always liked the idea of war <laughs> showing the medal of America. Yeah. And uh, of course he was in the Spanish American war uh, and he didn't have the world war one on his watch. Uh, but uh, he was always very critical of the Le- Woodrow Wilson's leadership during world war one. So he was another president who felt that, uh, you know, as appalling as that might sound to us today, yeah. that a good war is something that the country probably ought to have periodically. I don't think many Americans feel that way anymore. No, no. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned Rahm Emanuel because he was just here last week or so uh, speaking mm-hmm. to the Commonwealth Club. Um, so what are your thoughts on the upcoming elections? Any predictions? Um, you know, and where will the country be in eight to 12 years, red or blue? Two, <laughs> two big questions. But, uh, but I, I, part of this is the, the very interesting uh, factor, especially in the, the face of the coronavirus, that right. we have. Uh, three presidential candidates, all of whom are in their late 70s. Yes. You know, I mean, the, the three that are left. Right, exactly, we do. Yeah. 
And of course, the other part with the coronavirus is that President Trump, by his own admission, is a germophobe. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to shake hands with people. He's always using the Purell, even his own advisors. If someone sneezes in the room with him, he throws that advisor out. Mm -hmm. Now, how is he going to deal with this under those circumstances? And maybe this, I don't want to be into psychobabble, but maybe he just doesn't want to admit how bad it, it might be because he just is not that familiar with this sort of thing because he has just been a, uh, a guy who has been sort of on the other end of treatment of, uh, of uh, medical issues because he didn't want to deal with them himself. But I think that um, as far as where we'll be, uh, I've learned after 2016, you can't really predict these days. People, so much of this, what's going to happen, I think this November is going to be based on the turnout of the bases of the parties. That's you hear all this talk about intensity mm -hmm. and will the Republicans remain retain their intensity for Trump? Uh, will Biden, if he's the nominee, as it looks like he will be, uh, get any com comparable intensity from the Democrats? So you may end up with 40% of the country versus 40% of the country or more. In other words, we're in our separate camps and there's no compromise and people f are, are f in the, main uh, camps are trying to get that little sliver in the middle or will they just focus on ginning up their own supporters and i think that's probably what they're going to do it's going to be a very nasty and polarizing campaign the other quick point i wanted to make is that as time goes on i do believe that the country is changing in fundamental ways uh mainly that we're going to be a majority minority country in the 2040s that's being masked now because this is sort of the last gasp in many ways of the people who feel aggrieved in the white majority, working class white people, working class people who feel that they've been left behind. And I'm, I'm not demeaning this. I think they do feel that people don't pay attention to them in public life and they've been left behind and others aren't listened to. And that's part of what some people in the Democratic Party say that they need to do and then they could beat Trump pretty comfortably if they could get some of these aggrieved people to think that they will do something for them. Uh, but I think as time goes on, this question was about an eight to 10 year time frame, mm -hmm. but uh, it probably wouldn't happen in that, uh, that time frame. but a little, uh, a few more years than that, I think the country is going to be much different politically. Uh, we're going to have a, a majority who are African American, Latino, Asian, and, uh, I think that's we're going to look much different now, and it's going to be much difficult for the, more difficult for the Republicans to appeal to that country that we become um, because of the policies they're taking now. Mm -hmm. And uh, another media question: mm -hmm. um, the media, uh, do you think, has played a role in kind of uh, making the party uh, parties red and blue and 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 uh, sort of fifty fifty across the country because it makes for a good horse race? It does. So this, I, this is true. I, I happen to teach a course in this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I hear about this and we talk about this all the time. And this is a discussion in newsrooms all over the country. It's not that the media aren't aware of this sort of thing. Yeah, we are drawn to conflict and to, uh, to polarization in the sense that it makes for more sensational stories. And the feeling is that more and more people are drawn to those stories, readers, viewers and listeners. Uh, maybe that's a short-sighted view, but a lot of media are into marketing surveys now. And um, the positive stories tend not to get the readership the, uh, or the viewership. It's the negative stories that people remember. And they get the viewers and so on. And, and the other part of this that's very fundamental in discussing it is that the, the economics of the media have changed so much that now every news organization is not paid for by the overall enterprise. In other words, you get money from classified ads or ads in the sports section or whatever. The news division has to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. So that means there's much more desire to draw advertisers who want to get the viewership and the readership and the listenership. And that goes back to the idea of covering the conflicts and so on. And I've always been brought up in journalism to think that we're, we're there. Uh, we have two functions, education and entertainment. It's the entertainment side that's taking over much too much in my mind, not the educational side. But that, unfortunately, is the world we're in. That's the world we're in. And, and, and do you think that's influenced by the internet and clickbait and the, Absolutely. And the, the whole Absolutely. approach? And, and then we have a whole uh, new, very well-educated, I, I think, uh, 
generation, but they're very, very used to that approach to the they are. So they, they don't see they the, are. They absolutely the are. other options. Right. And also there's not a lot of interest in the history, I must say, or, right. or context. <clears throat> I, I know in the classes that I teach, <clears throat> uh, these uh, young people, were, they were basically born during Obama. They have almost no understanding of what happened before that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I hope to maybe uh, give them some interest in it. But, uh, and, and a lot of information does, does come from the internet. But that's not just for young people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are getting information. You can get whatever view you have reinforced through the internet or through websites or whatever. Uh, and people don't want to have their views challenged. So it's, uh, it's uh, confirmation bias. It's mm -hmm. the idea that uh, you want to get your views reinforced. And you can do that now more than you ever could and more easily than you ever could. And uh, that's, that's what's happening. It's, it's interesting, confirmation bias. And just, just to back it up a little bit because of history, you know, it used to be, uh, or when we were our, our childhood, teenage years, that, that uh, what put people in silos were their religious beliefs. And so that people were in their religious groups and this is what they identified with, their identity was. But people don't identify like that. They identify with all kinds of uh, different issues. Yes. Personal identity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And yeah. that has made a big difference in the way that it's done. So I like to look at it because I, I don't think that the younger generation is any different than ours. They, they have a slightly different training and right. those that can be educated out to the large uh, viewpoint, right. that, that just is taken care of. Right, yes. A little echo there for a second. Okay. All right. Um, so we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, what role, and we were just talking about this, what ro role will the millennials play in the upcoming election? I mean, obviously the, the, the one story about that is their interest in Bernie. Yeah. Another big irony for, for people our age that, that, you know, we used to not trust anyone over 30 and now the, the right. person who, who trusts uh, the 78 year old or, or whatever he right. is, is are, are everybody that's under 30. So, right. don't but it's an any, interesting. Don't trust anyone over 80 is what yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, I think that, um, uh, you know, I've heard this every election cycle ever since I've done this for many, many years now that this, the sleeping giants in our politics were Latinos and young people. Mm. It almost never turns out that way. Mm -hmm. The turnout is never what the most optimistic people in those groups uh, think it will. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it'll be different this time. Um, uh, Bernie did not get the turnout of young people that he expected mm -hmm. so far in this campaign. And he admits that. Um, now, you know, what who's going to turn out well it might be these aggrieved people mm -hmm. <laughs> that i've been talking about or people who uh just feel that they can't stand trump but it's a very negative atmosphere mm -hmm. and i don't think that's going to change so you know i think if some of the people in these cohorts we talked about latinos and young people turned out it probably would change the dynamic it might be a more positive feel to the race because they might want to know more about agendas and and positive concepts and proposals and so on. But if we end up with the, the election demographics that seem to be uh, developing as we've had in 2016, uh, it's going to be, the premium is going to be placed on attack and derision, ridicule, and, uh, and negativity. And I think that's where we're headed. Do you think that influenced Elizabeth Warren's rise and fall because she was so much uh, policy oriented and talking about ideas and it, it was just a personality contest? She didn't really realize that. Yeah, I think you know, she's very smart. I think she had to understand that. But I think what she didn't uh, understand fully is that uh, in order for her to expand her, her uh, support in a natural way, she had to eat into this huge Bernie Sanders faction out there. That was where she had to go. Uh, you know, if you added together Warren and Sanders and their turnout, they, they, that person who they had both of those could have won a, a lot of these primaries, uh, uh, especially when the moderates were more divided. Now that Biden is getting all the moderate votes, um, it's, uh, he, he's still not getting 50%, by the way, <laughs> but uh, really far from it. But I think what uh, Warren didn't understand fully is that um, – the Warren, the, the Sanders people were so committed to him, it was very hard to shake them out of that, and mm -hmm. she was unable to. 
and they were they were going to stay with Sanders. And you know that's another interesting thing. You you look at clips from Sanders, and a lot of us in the media do these mm -hmm. stories about these candidates running against their younger selves because they've right. been around so long. <laughs> How have they changed? Uh, what positions they used to take that they don't take anymore? How hypocritical they are. Sanders hasn't changed. You look at the clips of him when he first was elected mayor of Burlington, Vermont. He's saying exactly the same thing today. Mm -hmm. And that's what his, I think his supporters really respect that about him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why they are sort of unshakable, at least so far. One other little detail like that, since you're in the, uh, in the middle of all that. What's the kind of background idea of Biden going down and all of a sudden resurrected, put in front and winning all within a, within a couple of weeks? What's, what's the, it was, it who, was, who decided that? It was interesting. Well, <laughs> now we're not going to be conspiracy no, just kidding. theorists here. <laughs> well, I think what, uh, what happened is a number of, of the stars aligned for him almost perfectly. Mm -hmm. You know, he was given up almost for dead after right. losing, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire, and uh, Nevada, and then he wins South Carolina. Uh, he got a tremendous boost from Congressman Clyburn mm -hmm. from South Carolina, who had an African-American who endorsed him, his tremendous respect in the African-American community. That pushed the African-Americans to him in a big way, and most of the people in that primary were African-American. That's helped him in a lot of states since then. Then you had um, the uh, his, his competitors for the moderate votes, um, Buttigieg um, and... Um, Bloomberg was out of it, and um, uh, Globershar was out of it. So all those stars aligned. So and now it looks like, uh, you know, it was maybe it looked like he was going to have this happen all the time. I don't think he was. Mm -hmm. I think he lucked out in some ways. He played his cards right, and he got support when he needed it. And then it's, it appeared that the establishment was behind him almost fully, which, which, which they are, and that's really helping him now. All right. One, one final question. Since we've covered the president's, we're going to go back to the media. What's been the worst crisis for the news media in modern times? Which, which crisis? I don't know. Maybe I think the idea is made the news media look worse. Not, not what they, what they yeah. did, uh, yeah. what the crisis was, but what made the news media like not play their role correctly or whatever. Well, I think uh, I mentioned this a little bit before. I think that going for the weapons of mass destruction during the war in Iraq was a terrible mistake the media made. And, uh, uh, it, it, that we have yet to recover from that. It just we just went too much along with the government's what the government was saying. We could have found out other things about it. I think also um, the idea that we uh, it's not just a single crisis. It's a development that the media, the mainstream media, and and I understand that term. Although some journalists think it's a, it's a derisive term, but that's fine. I can use that term. But uh, we have. Uh, we don't really understand the country the way we should, especially the national media. We're in our own bubble. We complain about politicians being in a bubble. We're in a bubble too. And I think that's really hurt us with the country. We don't live like the rest of the country does in Washington and New York and Los Angeles, uh, media centers. Um, I don't think we understand the country as well as we used to. And uh, I know I first got into journalism, I felt like I was living like the people I was covering. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, the property taxes were the same. I was living in middle class houses and all the rest of it. I was raising a family. And um, now uh, it's much different. Education, um, secular rather than religious in the media, um, uh, valuing different things from the government and so on, and a lot of people do. And so I think we've lost our way in not understanding the rest of the country. Well, let's keep trying to understand each other a little bit better. That's what we're here for. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very, very much, Ken. This was just great. And uh, thanks for everybody who is watching and uh, or listening online now. Uh, and so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion.